Yeah, okay. So, uh, hi everyone, my name is Mike. Uh, I'm working from Ethicode. Um, we're going to tell the story of actually a journey that Samuel and I have been on for the last five years together. Yep. Um, working to transform Volvo uh, and especially around the way the development teams are working and how they deliver software. Yes. So, I'm Samuel Linder and I work at Volvo Group. And this doesn't work. Ah. Oh, it's not on. Okay. But then we do like this. Okay. So this is the mandatory corporate slide. <laughs> <laughs> what we do, we don't sell cars. Uh, we build uh, heavy equipment, trucks, buses, boat engines, etc. And uh, I particularly work in IT, but I also work with the embedded developers for the ECUs in the vehicles mainly. So no real IT work for me. <laughs> Yes, and Ethicode is a consulting company primarily. We also do training and events, uh, and our entire focus is around DevOps and continuous delivery. And we, we are based across Northern Europe. So, a little bit about our history. We started in 1927. I think we produced the first truck in 1928. Uh, we're still sitting in the same building as then. Our powertrain engineering still sits in the old factory building. And at some point, we started to uh, introduce software into this. Um, early 80s, I would guess, late 70s. Um, and myself, I started in 1995, so I've been uh, on this journey for quite some time. Um, and of course, we have seen this um, massive increase of software, as you know, uh, as all of you have done. But we were, we, I've divided it in different phases. And, and the initial phase is, we call it the learning phase, or I call it the learning phase, early 80s, 90s. Um, and in this um, learning phase, we only had a handful of engineers. I think there were three of them doing most of the software. And they sat in some faraway corner in the basement. It works well. <laughs> uh, and they did something that no one knew what it was. The rest of the organization had no clue what software was. Uh, but they knew that they had to do it to get the vehicle to work. We had to make sure that the engine started, etc. Um, also, they were forced to use the mechanical processes because there were no software process defined. And they had to use the same PLM systems, etc. And this um, caused a lot of interesting situations. For example, how do we release the software? How do we get it to the factory? How do we make sure that we can service the tracks, etc., when everything was designed to be a mechanical part? For example, release software. This is a quite interesting discussion that happened. Uh, you might not think that it actually happened, but it did. We treat so software as any other part. It has a part number, it has a life cycle, etc. But it, it's not really a part that you can touch, right? But the PLM system had some requirements for parts. A part had to have a weight, center of gravity. It also needed to be on a drawing and a manufacturing drawing that could be stamped with a released stamp and put on a microfilm card in our storage <laughs> facility somewhere. Really interesting. So how do we release the software? What, one of the proposals was to actually put it on the drawing form. So how do we do that? Do we do a hex format, source code, and then stamp it with released? Um, Luckily, this did not happen. We rejected this quite quickly, and we realized we have to build our PLM systems to manage software as software. So we set up some teams. Uh, some of them are here today and listening, and uh, we started to build our own PLM systems to manage software as software. We had similar issues with manufacturing. Manufacturing had to have, the part number had to have a shelf number, quantity. If quantity was zero, production stopped. So someone had to sit and click the button and increase the quantity of the software, not to stop production. That doesn't happen today, fortunately. Um, switching over to the early 200, 2000s, um, we went into something that is, I refer to as the problem phase. So we start to see an increased complexity. Uh, software development starts to speed up, but it's still a very, very small part of the whole production. Uh, or production development or development. Um, but the systems in the vehicle start to communicate with each other, start to get more complex. And we start to switch the stuff that had traditionally been hardwired through relays, etc., to be replaced with software. 
to save cost, weight, improved features, etc. They were not really needed to run the vehicles, and this is where the problem comes in, because now you start to introduce bugs, etc., in the software that didn't occur when you had it all hardwired. So it went from a necessity to a problem, in essence. It was always late, because no one knew how to write requirements properly. We didn't have a tool for requirements. Uh, we also saw a massive increase of bugs, feature fre fault frequency increased, etc. And it also suddenly was a large cost. Comparably small, but still large. It went from us saying that this feature would take 134 hours to develop to 10,000 hours. And then the idea of uh, developing software as something very efficient, small, cheap, it went away for a long time. And it was still a massive mystery to most people in the company. Then we went into the early 2010, or actually we can fast forward to about 2015. We now see that we have a massive increase of software, as you all have. Self-driving vehicles, all the features are driven by software. So the complexity increases a lot. And during this period, um, someone actually wrote the formal change request. How many of you have formal change requests in the company? You all have them, I guess. And it ended up in our process and IT department. And the um, formal change request was actually just, we need to have continuous integration. This ended up at process and IT. And the managers at Process and IT, they can't even spell to continuous. So that's a bit of a problem. That's a tricky <laughs> so word. It's a tricky word to spell. Most people get it wrong. So they asked me, what is that? So they asked me. I was the only one working at Process and IT with software, embedded software development. Do you know what it is? And I vaguely remembered a presentation that I had by some Danish guy. The only Danish guy I understand what it says, by the way. Because I'm not very good. He was at speaking English. English at the time. Yeah, we, we spoke English as well, but a bit of Danish as well. Um, he had a presentation a few months earlier before this question came about continuous integration. And I, I remembered it, so I said, yeah, I, I know what it is. A bit of a lie, but yeah, I knew somewhat what it is. So they asked me, do you know what it means? Then can you fix it? <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, I guess I can fix it. It's no problem. <laughs> So then they say, you know, then you can be the product manager. And I hate being a product manager. <laughs> but I said yes because there was no one else. And what do you do when you get back? You start to Google what is continuous integration. And you get lots of information. But I start to Google what is continuous integration for embedded C. And you get nothing. There was no information about it. So I thought, I'm in trouble. I said I knew what it was, but I, I have no clue. But then I actually found the business card from this nice Danish guy, and I, I gave him a call to get some help. And he came and made an amazing lightning presentation for us and for the software developers, and they were like a hallelujah moment, like, we need to have this guy, we need to have them uh, in. And we signed an agreement to, uh, to start to work together, and uh, I guess then he called you. Yes, so uh, the Danish guy is actually my business partner, Lars. Uh, he's in Den Denmark, but I'm in Oslo. And what we decided to do was to do a continuous delivery assessment with the, the teams at Volvo. And to be honest with you, we didn't really know what we chewed off because normally we would go in and assess a team, for instance. And you know, it's a very like it's a it's a process. We we know we're going to be there for a couple of weeks. We have these workshops we're going to do. But when we got to Volvo, we thought we were going to a team, but actually it was a team of team of teams. Yeah. It was, seven uh, it was teams. I don't know how many, yeah, it was, it was yeah, seven teams. So, and the interesting thing was that everybody was doing their own thing in a way. Like they had different version control systems or even different ways of using the same version control system. Some people had played around with te uh, nightly builds or automated builds, but it was still very much kind of a, a bit of a wild place to do software actually. Um, so, you know, we, we, we went in, and we, st we worked with the teams, and the first thing we do is something called value stream mapping, where we, we look at how software actually gets delivered in the organization from there being a need to it being running and delivering value to a customer. And this is really an interesting process because most companies we do this in, nobody has that view across the whole value stream, which is interesting when you think about it because that's all your organization is for 
I mean, a software organization is just it's it's just a factory floor to deliver features to customers in a sense. You want to deliver value, and the flow of value through that um, organization is the most interesting thing. So. Finding, finding out how the teams were actually working, not how they thought they were working, figuring out where the queues, the bottlenecks, the wait stakes, where the rework was coming in. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a fun process. And at the end of the, end of the workshops, we'd gone to you know, different areas, like how they do build, how they do test and qualification, the version control and, uh, and visibility. Um, we have a, a new model for doing this. This was five years ago. but. We came up with uh, our report, that basically a list of recommendations that we thought would be smart to do. Um, in the report, we, we categorized the, the things that Volvo were proud about, you know, the things that were going well, the things that uh, should be highlighted, uh, and also the things that were causing pain. And the interesting thing about this is that nearly all the pain around the software development process was in the tooling. And, and we say like the first eight or so uh, high priority pains in, in the report were all around the development experience. So that was really where we decided that would be the smartest place to start. A very easy thing to think, fix, we, well, so we thought. <laughs> and, you know, Internally in Volvo, maybe you can say a few words about this, Samuel. Yeah, so what we found with these seven different teams, we had more, but was that they never even, they barely knew each other. They hadn't talked to each other, but they were still delivering to the same vehicle. That's quite interesting. Um, what we also saw that they were, when we looked at where we are today, it was very, very diverse, as you said. They were working different ways and so on. But when we looked at the where do we want to be when we're done with this project, the picture was similar for all teams. So that made my life very easy because I had pretty much my backlog. Fix all of those things that everyone wants to have and, and you have a successful project. So. And actually, this is quite an interesting thing because it's, uh, it's one thing for us to come and make a lot of recommendations as consultants and outsiders, but to be able to turn the, the report and say, okay, based on what we've learned from, from this whole process, this is what we want to do. This is, this is, this is, this is our roadmap in the end. And from, from the report, we said that you know, we believe that establishing a common R&D IT infrastructure that could be the foundation for teams would be you know, a smart thing to do. It would help, you know, to help the teams work together, share experiences more, break down the silos, and also you know, just to generally improve the efficiency of the teams. And at the time, the, the tool landscape in, in, the, in the company was varied. Some, some tools were actually end of life. Some tools were barely supported, but mostly a license fee uh, deal. There wasn't a lot of um, pr process. How many of you have worked with ClearCase before? No. Okay. ClearCase, the version control system? Uh, how many of you enjoyed the process? <laughs> Very few <laughs> like to admit that I actually worked with it. But, uh. but uh, uh, what we, when, we, when we come with recommendations around tooling, it, it's never really just pick this tool or that tool because we understand that the tools we use today are probably going to be out of date. There'll be a better tool in a few years' time. So when we select tools, what we want to do is think about um, where we can use open standards. Uh, for, for instance, um, Version control. I mean, even five years ago, it was obvious that the right solution for version control would be Git. There wasn't anything else that was like this was where all of the development community was. This is what everyone was learning at university. This is what every other company was doing. It makes sense to use Git. Just use Git. There's no reason to do that. Anything else? Uh, when it came to you know the other tools, Jenkins, Artifactory, Jira. Confluence, they kind of made sense at the time. But each of these tools are actually quite easily replaceable too, and that was a, a, an important uh, part of that, dis that choice. So this is where we started five years ago, uh, and getting all the teams into this world uh, was a process of coaching, was a process of t taking time, because in the end, this is just like in the last presentation, in the end, it's the teams that need to run their own process, need to run their own value stream, they need to own the whole value stream. So uh, in, in the end, there isn't somebody, there isn't a DevOps team making the pipelines for these teams. They're, they're, they're all autonomous. So 
over time, you know, more and more tools came into the landscape. It became more important to, like, for instance, with Git, we, we have Bitbucket, but there's also GitHub and GitLab, and probably next year there'll be Azure or... Who knows? <laughs> who knows? But at least, the, at least the, the landscape's changing. It's a very fluid thing, but w always it's getting to better tooling for the developers, which is also a good thing for, uh, for morale, in, in a sense. It keeps people in the, te in, in the team if they're having a good time with the tools that they're using. And there's, there's some research that um, backs this. this is a, the, there's a lot of research going into DevOps just now. There's, a, there's the DevOps Research Asso and Assessments Company that was acquired by Google, but they've been doing the, this state of DevOps report for, for six years. Uh, and they do a lot of, they basically do a lot of scientific research into uh, DevOps practices and their effect on businesses. Uh, the, the State of DevOps report is a great place to start if you just want to understand you know, the, the key takeaways. But they al also have a book called Accelerate, which talks about the research methods they use and go much deeper into the details. So I, I really recommend it. And one of the things they found is that uh, software delivery performance and continuous delivery drives organizational performance. Basically, there's a, a causal link. A pro like team organizations that tend to do well financially also tend to have good software delivery performance. Uh, and they also found that culture matters a lot as well. Culture is predictive of your organizational performance. But what was less intuitive was that they found that continuous delivery, or the, the, the tools and mindsets around continuous delivery, can drive culture. So what they say is that investments in technology are also investments in people. So. Where are we today? We, I call this the revolution phase because, as Mike said you, in the previous slide, there is a lot of research that tells us that we need to change. We need to be more efficient to be able to deliver self-driving vehicles. We know complexity is going to be massive, and we're, we're not able to handle that if we don't change. And we saw that we could only go so far with the current processes and things that we had we had to make some sort of revolution. Um, we saw that the pressure on the CI teams and my team and, and Peter's team, we will talk later, and they, it's so high. We get so much requirement. Our, our, it doesn't matter. We can't find enough engineers, by the way. So our backlog is just growing and growing and growing. And we have more teams coming in. And suddenly, everyone should develop software. And they're not software engineers. They should be T-shaped persons. They should be able to do anything, all of them. So now we have a lot of engineers that are not the skilled three guys in the basement, but suddenly there are people who have written requirements and documents suddenly should write code. That, does, that is a big, big challenge. And, and to be able to manage that, we need to work in a completely different way. And we started on the IT tooling side in this way, and we, we decided not to go for safe, like the rest of the organization, because we thought that just putting new titles on the same persons doesn't really change the way that we develop. We need to do something different. We need, we need to have continuous everything. We need to do everything automated. And we need to find new ways of working with this. We need to have cross-organization collaboration. We don't care about if you're on IT or if you're in business side. If you want to write a tool that you need for your development, you should be able to write it. One of, our, one of the three guys in the basement still works in our organization. He, he once was told that you shouldn't work with writing code because you're not an IT. And he said that it's the same thing as cutting off my arms and legs and threw me in the swimming pool and tell me to swim. I need to write code. So we need to be able to get, I mean, break down the silos and the pipes and start to work cross commodities and don't care about who's your manager and where is the budget and so on. We need to be able to change the view on the IT parts and not see it as a cost. IT should not be a cost. It's part of the value stream. So to support the engineers that develop the products, that's part of the value stream. You're also part of the value stream. And this is quite a hard transformation to do. And to do that, you need to really build it from bottom up. And we're, in Sweden, we're quite good at not doing what our managers tell us. <laughs> so we're quite good at revolution. So it, it's easier for us than maybe some other countries. So we have to remove the control from above uh, and be able to do and deliver what we need to do. And we need to trust the engineers because they know what they're doing, I hope. And they can do great things if we allow them to do it. 
Uh, to do this, we also need to have very short feedback uh, loops and very frequent feedback so that we are, know that we are on the right track. We need to know that what we are actually building and showing actually works in reality, and it brings value. So we need to be able to deploy on demand, uh, preferably in the cloud somewhere, uh, or somewhere where it's flexible and, and we can do all the stuff that was shown earlier, and we, which we do as well. We need to be truly agile, and we need to do DevOps. And we started to do that. And how did we do that? We, we, put, um, we put the most skilled engineers in the room together, and we say, let's meet once a week. By the way, there is no budget for it, so you have to do it when you have no, nothing else to do. Let's just meet once a week. And, and we had some ideas, and I guess the two guys here in the front of the room here are the originators of some of the ideas, saying we can do automatic baseline creation, create a baseline which we can test upon. And then Tommy, who sits here, said, oh, well, if we do that, then we can do continuous deployment. By the way, we're not going to deploy software on a truck driving full speed on the autobahn, so you don't have to worry about that when you drive home, but we can do it in our context. We can say that this software is now ready to be shipped to the factory without a lot of human interactions. Remember I said I was the product manager. Do you, anyone can guess how long it took me from when someone wrote the CR until we actually officially started the project, having written down the basic requirements and so on. How long does it normally take to start an IT project? Any wild guesses? It took six months just to get the funding, the commitment from the managers that I can get the resources, etc. What we did in this, put about 10 people in a room once a week, let them work when they had the time for it, build a proof of concept. It took six months. To, we had a working prototype. It covers a, a lot of tools. It's an automated process that touches a lot of the central tools. We had to build some new tools, and uh, we had to, to do a lot of uh, communication between the tools, and uh, this was done in, in six months. And what do you do when you have done the proof of concept? We go to the developers and say, look what we have done. They didn't know because we hadn't told anyone we did this. So we presented it and say, try it, use it. I guess they tried it for a few weeks and then and, and started to use it a little bit. It was still running on like our QA servers or machines under the desk because it was a proof of concept. So it, it seemed to work. There was no problem with it. What do you do when, when you have done that? Then we say, we have to industrialize it. And to industrialize it, we, we shut it down and then we build a new version of it that is on the real production system. That was not a very good idea. It took, what, five minutes until people started to call and say, we can't work. We can't work because the continuous delivery pipeline doesn't work. So that was a proof of concept. You're not supposed to use it, but we had to switch it back on. It's still running on QA servers. So, uh, and it's quite actually uh, without any problems. So uh, we're trying to harden it step by step now instead of trying a different approach. Um, what was interesting with this is when we did this, we realized that we can do this for more things. We can, we can scale this up and, and, and drive our development in this way. Um, and we can do that from an IT tool perspective and remove all the over-administration and budgeting issues and so on. Uh, our product development teams, they still work sort of agile in SAFE. But I think that when they start to see what we can do and the speed we can achieve on the IT side, I think we started the revolution. So my, I mean, this has been a very good experience for us, for me, and uh, working together with Mike. But what I want to, to say in the end of this is that uh, you don't have to have a lot of people start to start a revolution. It's only a handful of persons in a, in a room, if you have the right persons. But also, if you need it, call Mike and get help, because it's really <laughs> valuable to get someone from the outside that understands or have a different perspective on your organization and how it actually performs. You get, very, you get your blindfolds on and you only see what you do and have done for the last 10 years. If someone else comes in with a different perspective, you can really start to change and, and make a revolution. So, thank you. <laughs>